When the Soviet Union announced the launch of the tiny Sputnik satellite on October 4th, 1957, the United States held its collective breath and pondered the larger meaning of its die-hard political adversary actually possessing the technical means to send an atomic weapon around the globe to strike American soil. The silly beeping of that small sphere flying over North America every 90 minutes belied the existential shock of knowing we had nothing of the sort that was anywhere near this level of success. Many Americans today still remember looking up in the night sky and seeing that single white star moving across the zenith with improbable velocity. And it was a Russian star, a communist star, and its very existence mocked America to its core. Project Mercury was announced one year after the Sputnik launch on October 7, 1958. NASA Administrator Dr. T. Keith Glennon approved the project by saying, quote, let's get on with it, end quote, underlining the high risk and potentially high payoff of the ensuing space race with the Soviet Union. NASA's initial focus on simply getting American astronauts into space shifted less than two years later into studying the feasibility of actually sending men to the moon. Concept development for Project Apollo was announced to the aerospace industry in July of 1960. And a year later, President Kennedy made his dramatic speech to Congress. Of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Setting the goal of putting Americans onto the moon and bringing them back safely before the decade was out. What we know today as Project Apollo. When President Kennedy pledged to put a man on the moon, NASA had barely put a man into orbit. While Kennedy would never see that day, the world did. Apollo 8 was the first crewed mission to orbit the moon, 10 times in fact. But now, the stakes were higher. Attempting to land on the moon, walk the surface, and return to Earth seemed like a fantasy. In reality, Apollo 11 was poised to make history. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins were ready, strapped inside their capsule atop the mighty Saturn V, a three-stage rocket standing at 363 feet, 60 feet taller than the Statue of Liberty. Its first stage, capable of producing seven and a half million pounds of thrust, burning 40,000 pounds of fuel every second for two minutes, until a second and third stage pushed them into orbit. In fact, the Saturn V burned more fuel in one second than Charles Lindbergh used to cross the Atlantic. His plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, used only 450 gallons of fuel. I'm now step off the lamb now. With Commander Neil Armstrong's famous words in the history books, the United States started a love affair with the moon and the heavens beyond Earth's orbit that continues to this day. NASA is currently preparing to return to the moon and establish sustainable lunar exploration, first by sending instruments and hardware, followed by astronauts. But before engineers were ever dreaming of rovers on Mars and flight beyond the gravity of Earth, two brothers were dreaming of just flying in their own backyard. The story of NASA Langley and its achievements in space travel ultimately began in Dayton, Ohio, almost 140 years ago. Before Orville and Wilbur Wright achieved the first powered, sustained, and controlled airplane flight in 1903, they were given a gift from their father, a small model helicopter designed by French aviation pioneer Alphonse Pinot. It was made of cork, bamboo, and paper. Powered by a rubber band that twirled its blades, the model took flight only for a moment, but captured the boys' imaginations for a lifetime and fostered a love for aeronautics and flight. After a successful printing business and thriving bicycle company, Wilbur wrote to the Smithsonian Institute and the Weather Bureau for information and advice regarding theories of flight and aeronautics. In the back of their booming bike shop, they began to construct their own gliders. 
Orville also became an avid bird watcher and would later say, quote, learning the secret of flight from a bird was a good deal like learning the secret of magic from a magician, end quote. Indeed, they designed and flew three gliders between 1900 and 1903 on the windy dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, testing their theories and designs. On a cold December morning in 1903, with little fanfare, Orville Wright took flight for only 12 seconds in his flyer and changed the world forever. 240 miles north of Kitty Hawk, a few days before Orville's successful flight, Samuel P. Langley was attempting manned powered flight with his new aerodrome after he had successfully launched two unmanned steam powered flyers a few years earlier. Langley hired Charles M. Manley as his engineer and test pilot. Shortly after launch, it promptly fell into the Potomac River. While Langley's failure was a national story, the brothers' success was hardly acknowledged. Twelve years after the Wright's historic flight, the federal government would establish NACA, or the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Orville Wright would serve as a board member for 28 years, spending time at the first aeronautics laboratory established in 1917, the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory on Langley Field. With the advent of jet-powered flight and the beginning of space research, President Eisenhower would create the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, in 1958, absorbing NACA and its 8,000 employees with a budget of $100 million. In 1958, there was a space task group formed at Langley, which provided uh, the beginning of the program planning for what became the Mercury, then the Gemini program, and then later the Apollo program. In the early 1960s, Langley helped give birth to the space age. Project Mercury, the nation's inaugural man in space program, was conceived and managed initially from Langley, providing technical knowledge, tunnel testing, and astronaut training. During Mercury, Langley was already building and constructing hardware for Project Gemini, the next program intended to support NASA's final program, Apollo, landing astronauts on the moon. To accomplish this goal, three options were chosen, direct ascent, Earth orbit rendezvous, and lunar orbit rendezvous. After much debate, NASA announced that Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, or LOR, would be the method by which we reach the moon. This assembly would include a mothership or command module connected to a service module containing the fuel cells and main engine, and a small lunar lander or excursion module that would detach from the command module and descend to the surface of the moon. John Hobalt, the engineer of LOR, fought an uphill battle to convince NASA his idea was the best. John was one of what we have too few of nowadays. John was a technical maverick. Uh, if you look, you can, you can Google technical mavericks uh, and, and you find out that these are the people that produce the ideas that everybody else lives off of. John had um, a real struggle persuading the folks in our agency that the very best way to get to the moon was not the use of a huge monster rocket that would take off from here, land on the moon, and take off from the moon, land back. It was just completely impractical. But it still took him a struggle to persuade people that the lunar orbit rendezvous technique was the very best. It's, it sounds, when you describe it, it sounds complicated. Even at, at one, one presentation he gave, someone in the audience shouted, your, your numbers lie, because they really didn't believe it. It just seemed too good to be true that you know that you could do all that on uh, and yet save all that weight. But he knew he was right. He knew he had the numbers, and the numbers were spot on. In fact, Ed Garrick, Hobalt's boss at NASA, is quoted as saying, "I can safely say I'm shaking hands with the man who single-handedly saved the government twenty billion dollars." Still, between 1960 and 1973. The Apollo program cost the United States $28 billion, or 4.3% of the federal budget at its peak in 1965. 
But drawing LOR on the back of envelopes and chalkboards was not enough. A simulator was needed to perfect the linking of the LEM, or Lunar Excursion Module, to the command module. The ability to rendezvous and dock the two vehicles in space after a successful mission on the moon was critical to the success of LOR. A failure meant the two astronauts and the LEM would be unable to return to Earth, and NASA would have no means to rescue them. The rendezvous docking simulator was originally constructed for the Gemini program to practice docking of space capsules with other vessels. It became operational in 1963 at a cost of $320,000. Only after the Apollo astronauts had successfully mastered rendezvous and docking abilities in the simulator would NASA give permission for the attempt to land on the moon. This is a very important simulator. This was key to, to this mission. It's suspended by cables and gimbals. It has six degrees of freedom, X, Y, Z. Uh, roll pitch, yaw, and the astronauts would come here and, and fly this simulator and practice the docking. They're right on the ceiling of, of the hangar. Uh, so this was very exciting for a young person, and I was a young person. I mean, I, I was fresh out of college, and I, I was hired as an aerospace engineer, even though I was a physics major. And my office was in the building, and our lab was the hangar floor and the hangar ceiling with this docking simulator. And the maneuver was between the lunar excursion module and then had to dock with the command and service module. The RDS was declared a historic landmark in 1985 and still hangs from the rafters in Building 1244. With the help of this ingenious device, they were able to master all of the necessary rendezvous and docking skills before liftoff. But hardware and simulators do not operate without a human component. In addition to the engineers, mechanics, and other personnel in the hangar and on center, human computers were hired and played major roles in trajectory analysis, supersonic flight research, and the space program. By 1946, Langley Research Center had 400 female human computers. In 1967, after filling out an application and mailing it to Langley, a young female schoolteacher and mathematician named Christine Darden joined the computer pool. I was assigned to the computer office in the reentry physics branch. So, so the, uh, of course, the reentry physics branch is the branch that would have done or at least participated in the calculations of the reentry conditions for the Apollo vehicle. For all of them, in fact, for the uh, Mercury, the Gemini, and the Apollo. The angle at which the spaceship would come back into the atmosphere and the speed at which it would come into the atmosphere to make sure that it didn't get so hot that it would burn the vehicle or that it would bounce off of the atmosphere and go back out into space. Christine soon wanted more from her position. Rather than analyze data, she wanted to produce it. As the uh, engineers were bringing equations to me to solve and everything, uh, by this time I'm beginning to think, you know, these are very much like the equations I studied in graduate school. Uh, I wonder why I'm over here and they're over there in the engineering office. And I said, but I guess it's because they have engineering degrees. And somebody said to me, no, they're, they're two or three of those guys over there have math degrees. I said, is that right? So I said, then I'm going to go and ask about transferring. So I went to my immediate supervisor and asked about transferring to the engineering section. And I was told, no, that, that wasn't possible. Because all the women pretty much were put into the computer offices, yeah. After a few weeks, I said, I, uh, I'm going to a higher level supervisor and ask. And, and, and I also said, if I get fired, I'll go teach. I went, I called the director who was several levels up and went in and said, well, I'd like to just ask you a question. I said, I'd like to know why a male and a female coming here with pretty much the same background are put in such different jobs when they get here. I said, the male is put into the engineering section the female is being put into a computer section. She doesn't do any research. She doesn't give any talks. 
and, uh, and she doesn't get promoted. So he looked at me and he says, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question before. And I says, well, I'm asking it now. Her tenacity and persistence paid off. Her supervisor transferred her to the engineering department, where she was one of just a few female aerospace engineers at NASA Langley at that time. Darden earned her PhD in 1983 and was referred to as a preeminent expert on supersonic flight and the reduction of sonic booms. She worked as a manager and advanced to become the first African-American woman at Langley to be promoted into the senior executive service, the top rank in the federal civil service. She was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 2019. Christine has had many advocates during her career at Langley, one of whom was Mary Jackson, NASA's first black female aerospace engineer in 1958. Mary, along with Dorothy Vaughn, NASA's first black supervisor of the West Area Computers, and Katherine Johnson, were the subjects in the film Hidden Figures in 2016, a biographical drama loosely based on the nonfiction book of the same name, about black female mathematicians working at NASA. These women overcame racial discrimination and segregation, playing crucial roles in the early space program. Johnson, also a computer, was temporarily assigned to an all-male research team in 1962 and quickly earned the respect of her bosses and colleagues with her knowledge of analytical geometry. Katherine Johnson was actually our room mother my freshman year at Hampton University. Her daughter is my classmate. Dorothy Vaughn's son was my classmate, and Mary Jackson's niece was my classmate. So I am in that generation uh, rather than the movie generation. <laughs> All of us were on the corner when John Glenn did that orbital flight. We were all on the corner at Hampton University watching the parade of John Glenn. We were seniors in college then. During spaceflight testing, astronauts were cautious of putting their lives in the care of electronic calculating machines. As part of the pre-flight checklist, John Glenn asked engineers to, quote, get the girl, referring to Katherine Johnson, to run the same numbers programmed into the computer, but by hand, in pencil. Katherine Johnson recalls Glenn saying, quote, if she says they're good, then I'm ready to go, end quote. Glenn's flight was a success and marked a turning point in the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union in space. In 2015, at age 97, Katherine Johnson was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by then-President Obama. This award is America's highest civilian honor. My problem was to answer questions. And I did that to the best of my ability at all times, correct or incorrect, but that's my theory. Like what you're doing, you, then you will do your best. If you don't like it, same on you. While NASA Langley's researchers and engineers calculated, tested, and pondered the overall success of the Apollo mission, NASA knew nothing mattered if astronauts couldn't stick the landing on the moon and return home. The final element of John Hobalt's concept needed to be tested. The moon. How really to get there and back? What conditions would the astronauts encounter on the quarter million mile journey to our orbiting neighbor? More importantly, how could the astronauts possibly train to fly with precision their ungainly lander in the completely alien environment of the airless moon and only one-sixth of the Earth's gravity? As more questions were asked, more problems were uncovered. Fortunately, NASA nurtured some of the greatest minds in engineering and science to answer those questions. Towering over 200 feet above the southwest corner of the NASA Langley facility in Hampton, Virginia, NASA's once decommissioned Lunar Lander Research Facility is being put to use again as a dynamic test bed for the next generation of American spacecraft. Good 
this was a physical simulator where they trained the astronauts to do the last 150 feet descent to the lunar surface. And it was built in 63, operational in 65 time frame. And we actually put people in the 150 foot platform up there and they launched off of there with a vehicle. It wasn't exactly looking like the lunar lander, but it supported five sixths of the weight of the vehicle and they had actually land it on a, a spot on the ground and they could pick where that was. Uh, the bridge that traveled with the vehicle allowed it to travel at 30 feet per second longitudinally and laterally so they could pick a spot and actually have three dimensions they could land in to get to the surface spot they were looking for. And most of the testing was done at night too so it simulated the lunar surface with a three degree angle of, of light uh, so it gave long shadows so that given that feel for it. This huge structure grew from the fertile imagination and brilliant engineering mind of W. Hewitt Phillips, chief of NASA Langley's Stability and Control Group, when he and a small group of engineers began in 1963 to come up with a solution for understanding and training for a rocket-powered landing in a lunar gravity field that was a mere one-sixth of the Earth's. For this critical phase of the Apollo program, Phillips fabricated the first model of the Lunar Lander Research Facility using an Erector Set model kit in his home workshop. The concept was approved at a cost of $3.5 million, and work began immediately on full-scale design and construction. The system became operational in 1965. Within an amazing complex series of girders, trusses, and a movable bridge crane, the 400 by 230 foot ground footprint underneath the gantry provided the Apollo astronauts a huge three-dimensional space in which they could practice the final 150 feet of their planned lunar landings. The Lunar Excursion Module Simulator was a manned rocket-powered vehicle used to familiarize the Apollo astronauts with the handling characteristics of a lunar landing type vehicle. The gantry provided the astronauts with a much richer simulation environment than was available with a static unit inside a conventional laboratory. In addition to providing motion cues along all three axes of roll, pitch, and yaw, it also allowed for an actual vertical descent to a simulated lunar surface with the astronauts controlling their descent rate with a small rocket engine, reinforcing both the aural and vestibular cues they would be experiencing during the real lunar descent. Attesting to the engineering and planning skill that went into development of the Lunar Lander Research Facility, astronaut Neil Armstrong, when asked what it was like to land on the moon, replied, quote, like Langley, end quote. That iconic statement, like Langley, speaks volumes about the incredible talent that could imagine a problem, understand it, and visualize a solution, and then translate all of it into physical reality and computer-controlled reactions that correctly mirrored an unproven reality a quarter million miles away. I think that what it did, it improved the safety of the mission. So they would have made it to the moon, but would they have been okay? I think this is where we came in, is we were able to make it a safer way to land on the moon. American challenge of today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. With the demise of the Apollo program in the early 1970s, there was no immediate need for either the gantry or the simulation controls for any new space systems. However, recognizing the usefulness of the massive 3D space within its structure, NASA, in 1974, repurposed the gantry as the Impact Dynamics Research Facility. As the name implies, the structure was used to hoist airplanes to varying heights and attitudes, at which point they were dropped to study the structural dynamics of a crash. After nearly 30 years of crash tests, funding for the facility dried up, and NASA made plans for decommissioning and demolition. 
But in 2003, a revived NASA crew vehicle program, Constellation, and potential Mars missions necessitated reconfiguring the venerable structure again into a landing impact research facility, reverting to many of the functions and modes of the original Apollo research. Of particular interest was providing a pool suitable for water landing tests of the Constellation and other commercial crew vehicles, recalling the dramatic early days of America's manned space programs. Today, the complex is in high demand from NASA and various commercial companies who see the need for future development of aeronautical and space exploration systems to take humans far into the cosmos.